If you haven't played it, Psycholonials is a visual novel by Andrew Hussey, the person responsible for Homestuck. It's a story about what happens when clowns become socialists. It has an incredible soundtrack and a strange visual style which really grows on you. The thing is, not to be a game reviewer from 2016, but Undertale is a game best played fresh. The story makes excellent use of rising stakes, but it also makes it almost impossible to give any description of without spoiling the experience of reading it moment to moment for the first time. It's a really special game that is severely under-talked about. It's only $3 on Steam and takes about 6 or 7 hours to complete, so play it and then come back to this video. The rest won't make any sense if you don't. Anyway, on with spoilers. Psycholonials is a story about a socialist revolution gone awry. A certain unnamed podcast said that its message wasn't specific to socialism, and it was more of a critique of ideology in general. I could not disagree more. The forces it's exposing may be present in all other types of revolution, but the specific connection it has to the success of a socialist or communist revolution isn't present in, say, a capitalist or fascist revolution. We don't have to fail where Z did. I truly believe communism is possible, but to create it we must learn from our past which strategies have and have not been successful. Psycholonial's Jubilite Revolution bears a stark resemblance to the Russian Revolution, and the Soviet state that came after. I think it'll be useful to compare the fictional revolution in Psycholonial's to the real world revolution in Russia. After the overthrow of the Romanovs in 1917, the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party split in two over the question of revolution. The Mensheviks were in favor of establishing a temporary capitalist, liberal republic, with an inclusive ruling class open for anyone to join, and then transitioning through reforms into socialism, whereas the Bolsheviks, with Lenin at their helm, argued for an immediate transition to socialism with a strictly organized party in control. The Jubilate movement highly resembles the Bolshevik party, with Z taking the place of Lenin, Z even engages in theft to fund her operation, just like Lenin did. Fortunately for us, the Bolsheviks were the ones who won, so we'll be able to compare the outcomes of both their regimes. After the successful takeover of Russia for the Bolsheviks and Nantucket Island for the Jubilates, did either of them actually manage to successfully implement the socialist governments they were hoping to? The answer of course is no. To quote Emma Goldman, In Russia, there is no socialization, either of land or of production and distribution. Everything is nationalized, it belongs to the government exactly as does the post office in America or the railroad in Germany and other European countries. There are naive people who believe that at least some features of communism have been introduced into the lives of the Russian people. I wish it were true, for that would be a hopeful sign, a promise of potential development along that line. But the truth is that in no phase of Soviet life, no more in the social than in the individual relations, has there ever been any attempt to apply communist principles in any shape or form. The situation in the Wimsa phase is a little more vague. The precise way the revolution has changed the average jubilate's relation to the means of production is never stated, but given that the structure of the rest of the organization is both shown to be, and described as, hierarchical, it can be reasonably assumed that it's not based on collective ownership. So low-level jubilates have just as little control over their political and economic lives as they did before the revolution. Neither jubilates nor Bolsheviks were as successful in installing socialism, and, instead, installed systems with an authoritarian dictator and a hierarchical structure. As they went on, they both came to greater resemble the capitalist system they were supposedly trying to overcome. It seems like the two hard stances the Jubilate Manifesto makes, outside of pranks and gender stuff, are that colonialism and capitalism are bad. Those are both obviously good things to be against. The only problem is that Z and the Jubilate movement as a whole are guilty of both those in great measure. It's no coincidence that Riotus gives the displacement of large populations as an example of colonialism in the same chapter where Z expels the entire population of Nantucket, which as Abby is quick to remind her, as a native word. Z is doing the same colonization that America did on the same land. Later she even plans to colonize Martha's Vineyard. Capitalism reproduces itself in the Jubilate movement and the reappropriation of America's military industrial complex. Z creates relationships between the Jubilates and the military contracting companies. In her words, plutocrats, oligarchs, financiers, and war profiteers are always unknowingly eager to find a new ring to kiss. And the newer and shinier the ring is, the faster they run to kiss it. The Wimsafe is just another customer to these companies. They know she's not a threat. She needs them. Capitalism also reproduces itself in the Jubilate's willingness to engage in the same tactics which corporations engage in. Z agrees with Jocelyn's proposal to buy out whole companies and bribe authorities, even after she uses the fact that billionaires would do the same thing as an excuse. Z has stated her hatred of billionaires many times, but when the morality of her plans are excused because billionaires would have done the same thing, she doesn't bat an eye. 
The Jubilites even have a marketing wing. The USSR is also guilty of devolving into the same capitalism and colonialism they hope to destroy. According to Piper Tompkins, the Bolshevik state morphed further and further into a capitalist nation-state like any other. Stalin fully developed the USSR into a capitalist nation-state, ideologically enshrining socialism in one country, a complete oxymoron by the standards of the historical socialist movement, and building the USSR up into a neocolonial superpower with nuclear capability. This model of Stalinism was exported throughout the world through Stalin's command of the Comintern and military expansion into Eastern Europe. The Russian Revolution was no more, and on its ashes stood a number of police states where capital continued to exploit labor. The Soviet Union itself collapsed, and China and Vietnam went through market reforms for the installation of typical private capitalism and the deconstruction of the state capitalist system of socialism in one country. It's worth noting that the Jubilates also gained nuclear capability, and it was even after they took control of Russia. The Jubilates are even responsible for exporting their ideology to many different countries, in the exact same way Stalinism was. The USSR also seized the profit of workers, just as the Jubilates consider the profits of its new marijuana plantation the property of New Wimsefe. The state took the bulk of what was produced and realized it as profit for itself by selling it on the market. This meant the capitalist economy with its wage labor, money and markets, private property, class division, and state machine were all preserved. The working class and peasants remained the exploited laboring population that generated capital and profit for a capitalist class, who owned and controlled the production of wealth. As such, the Bolshevik party was a capitalist class that imposed its rule, exploitation, and oppression of workers through its capitalist state with the ideological justification that the Bolsheviks as revolutionaries represented the working class. In the end, both the Jubilates and the Bolsheviks developed into the very systems they hoped to destroy. Is this outcome inherent to socialist revolutions? Will all attempts to create socialism in this way, as the often repeated communism only works on paper but not in practice would suggest? Of course not. The solution is in a simple change of tactics. Surely Z should be as good of a revolutionary leader as you could ask for. She's obviously gifted in strategy, passionate about the project, and extremely capable of getting a large group of people to rally behind her. She may not be the nicest person in the world, but it's clear that she truly hates the injustices of America and capitalism. Sadly, none of that matters. To quote Malatesta, And even if men of infinite goodness and knowledge existed, and even supposing, what has never been observed in history, that governmental power were to rest in the hands of the most able and kindest among us, would government office add anything to their beneficial potential? Or would it instead paralyze and destroy it, by reason of the necessity men in government have with dealing with so many matters they do not understand? And, above all, of wasting their energy keeping themselves in power, their friends happy, and holding in check the malcontents as well as subduing the rebels? The anarchist position is that having a leader at all is the problem. This makes sense when you consider the ultimate goal of communism. That being a society where people are entirely free, where there are no classes, no money, and no masters. How can you simultaneously believe that each and every person is competent enough to live freely, governing themselves without any authority imposing on them, while also believing that they are too incompetent to create a world where that is possible without the imposition of a central authority in the first place? Anarchists don't believe that systems such as the state or capitalism suddenly become our allies when one of our allies becomes immersed in them, any more than a police officer becomes a good cop when they happen to have good intentions. According to Rick Socialist leaders who are finding themselves caught up in the electoral machine end up being gradually transformed into nothing more than bourgeois with liberal ideas. They have placed themselves in determinant conditions, which in turn determine them. The perils of the state and capitalism are not the fault of the moral character of whoever happens to be in charge at the time. Instead, these systems force individuals to fundamentally change the goals they aspire to, even when they don't realize it. The goals of a politician are entirely opposed to the goals of a socialist, by being caught up in the electoral machine, socialists can only ever seek to reproduce and expand the power of the state, never seek to lessen or abolish it. In the words of Malatesta, a government, that is, a group of people entrusted with making the laws and empowered to use the collective power to oblige each individual to obey them, is already a privileged class and cut off from the people. As any constituted body would do, it will instinctively seek to extend its powers, to be beyond public control, to impose its own policies and give priority to its special interests. Having been put in a privileged position, the government is already at odds with the people whose strength it disposes of. Someone in a position of state power, instead of being able to use the state as a tool, as Lenin and Zeus tried to do, are only ever able to be a tool of the state. They are not, and can never be our allies. It's foolish to think that any single individual could ever win in a fight between themselves and a system exponentially larger than they are. Instead, they end up being gobbled up by it. Because of this, anarchists choose to fight oppression in the state through the outside. 
They choose to allow people to engage in communistic activities such as directing consensus democracy in the process of creating communism, not only once communism is underway, both because doing otherwise would result in the same situation we started with, and because it's good practice. Anarchists are aware that each and every working class person may not be ready for a life where they are able to self-determine and live in free association with other people. However, this is not a problem. Instead, it allows us to kill two birds with one stone. We've already talked about how when people are placed into determinate conditions, they in turn determine them. Even Marx is aware of how material conditions shape someone. I shouldn't with this quote. By thus acting on the external world and changing it, he at the same time changes his own nature. He develops his slumbering powers and compels them to act in obedience to his sway. We hope to develop these slumbering powers in the proletariat who engage in a revolution in a much different way than how these powers are developed in people who are swallowed up by the state. By making our revolutionary organizations, or lack thereof, function as close to our communistic goal as possible, we develop these revolutionaries into people more than capable of engaging with the world we want to create, according to Malatesta, but if it is to be feasible, communism requires a huge moral improvement in the members of society. Plus, a highly developed and deep-seated sense of solidarity that the thrust of revolution may not well be enough to bring forth. Especially if, in the early days, the material conditions that encourage its development may not be in place. Such contradictions can be remedied through the immediate implementation of communism only in those areas and to the extent that circumstances allow, while collectivism is applied to the rest, but only on a transitional basis. However, lest it relapse into bourgeoisism, it's going to have to make a rapid evolution in the direction of communism. This change in praxis is a true way forward for communism. No longer will we have to worry about accidentally recreating the USSR, to the collective I told you so from every capitalist bootlicker in the world. This idea of means and ends explains why the USSR and the Jubilate Revolution both became the monsters they hoped to slay, and it also explains why Z was turned into a tyrant. Being a dictator changes Z from a depressed sub-1000 follower Instagram star to a murderous tyrant. The similarities between Z and Stalin are so apparent that even Abby mentions it. She develops a deep paranoia directed at the people under her. She carries out public executions and maintains a list of people for a secret police to murder. She used to actually care about the things she's fighting against. Now she's too stressed to even think about the world she's trying to create. All she's able to think about is reproducing and expanding her own power. It's the same infinite expansion mindset which she would fault capitalists for. It all feeds into more pranksis, more money, more publicity, more financial independence and leverage around the world. More pranksis. She even acknowledges that Abby's parents' money is the reason why they're so shitty, but she's unable to see how her own power is twisting her into a monster. From her perspective, everything she's doing has made sense. It is all in service of creating socialism. Of course she would accumulate an unfathomable amount of money and power. She's trying to create a better world. She needs to become the true successor, and she doesn't trust anyone else to do it for her. Z's transformation was inevitable from the moment she started. Inevitability is a major motif of the story, from the actions of characters and institutions, to the player repeatedly being given a choice only for it to be taken away from them. Z talks about inevitability when she's explaining her decision to execute everyone on her anti-list. Inevitability is defined by the forces which try to stop it. Its strength is measured by everything that gets in its way only to be crushed. The power of a nation, the heart of a friend, and even the conscience of the host. Or, that is to say, the vessel meant to deliver the unstoppable. Your conscience can make you bleed through your nose and turn your knuckles white to put up a fight against the inevitable, but just like every single one of those miserable rats, it never stood a chance. Z's humanity was destroyed by being run through the system of dictatorial power. The old zone is gone until she is finally far away from those conditions. Certain types of dictators or old Roman emperors made an art form out of staying in power by doing anything imaginable, no matter how nasty just to keep themselves alive. But how is that any way to live? What does it do to the soul? It probably just slowly destroys it. Z is an example of how someone hoping to create socialism can go wrong, but there is someone who is an example of how it can go right. Abby is a positive revolutionary figure. She doesn't believe herself better equipped to end people's oppression than they themselves are. Instead, she tries to help by spreading the ideas and supplying everything at her disposal to the cause. Her house became the de facto headquarters for the movement, and she was eager to let Z rob her billionaire parents to fund the operation. Of course, the best example of her positive influence is her involvement with BTS. Abby talked to BTS about the Jubilate movement, and they quickly became inspired to take over their own studio, entirely of their own volition. It's no coincidence that they were only able to take over South Korea after Abby was retired from her position within the Jubilate movement. Now that her desires are no longer being twisted by the state, she's finally able to make a positive change. Those boys didn't even need to use violence to do it. 
I'm by no means a pacifist, but I think the lack of bloodshed is a sign that Hussey is very much trying to communicate the validity of Abby's revolutionary actions, in comparison to Z's. Z herself barely seems to care about the Jubilates as people. To Z, the members of the Jubilate movement aren't individuals with hopes and dreams. They're movable pieces, a necessary liability. When the first batch of armed Jubilates arrived at Nantucket, Z describes them as just another bunch of sumps for your collection. She then immediately goes to push one of them into the ocean for the crime of wearing their clown makeup in public, when a simple order to wipe it off would have sufficed. After Percy dies while saving Z's life, she doesn't even seem to care. Instead, she spends her next few moments giving the order to fake a biological attack on Nantucket. Keep in mind, Percy wasn't some nameless grunt. She was in direct communication with him for weeks while she was having him flirt with Abby's mom. She had at least some small emotional connection to him, or at least you would think she did, but the only time she shown to care about his death at her hands is the very moment he was shot. By virtue of his allegiance to her, he has already forfeited his life in her eyes. Early, arguably anarchist philosopher Mark Stirner had this to say about what the death of a soldier is to their nation. Just observe the nation that is defended by devoted patriots. The patriots fall in bloody battle or in the fight with hunger and want. What does a nation care for that? By the manure of their corpses, the nation comes to its bloom. The individuals have died for the great cause of the nation, and the nation sends some words of thanks after them and has a profit of it. After Percy's death, Z simply makes his corpse her lock screen and doesn't give him the time of day. She's got a movement to run after all. There's no time to shed a tear over a disposable cog in her machine. Due to her position of power, Z is unable to give the people she is supposedly trying to help even the bare minimum respect and consideration they deserve. Of course, none of the Jubilates speak this concern. In fact, who can and cannot speak is very important in Psycholonials. Characters only have the power of speech when they're being disobedient. There's only six characters in the story who have lines. Riotus, Z, Abby, Percy, Jaculine, and Mizzlebit. Let's look at each of them and examine when and why they're able to speak. The answer for Riotus is simple. The only person we see him talking to is Z, and he is, at least somewhat, of an authority figure for her. Z is a little more interesting. She is able to talk through most of the story, being the authority figure for every character, save for Riotus. She is even able to speak to Riotus most of the time, but if you pay attention, you'll see that everything she says to him is a disagreement, or at least being generally disagreeable. Jaculine is annoyingly verbose, and, as we learn later, was the person who originally cancelled Z. Even though she appeared to be a devout jubilate, she was anything but. Mizzlebib's capability to speak is derived from a similar source, but instead of being disobedient because of her hatred of Z, she was disobedient out of her desire to become a supreme honk effects. In fact, a sharp reader could have predicted the moment where she speaks the devil emoji by the fact that she can speak at all. Percy could speak in the beginning of the story. He's holding his own against Z's taunts, maintaining his dignity as much as a simp can, but once Z becomes supreme honk effects, Percy's devotion grows deeper, and he never utters another word. He appears in quite a few scenes, but he has become more of a background fixture than a person. Abby is an interesting case. Of course, we know that she loves Z even more than any of the Jubilates, but she still has the second highest number of lines. Despite, or perhaps because of, her love for Z, she is willing to disagree with Z's decisions. She cares for the Z she knows, not the tyrant she has become. Stirner has a quote about this. If I cherish you because I hold you dear, because in you my heart finds nourishment, my needs satisfaction, then it is not done for the sake of a higher essence whose hollowed body you are. Not on account of my beholding in you a ghost, an appearing spirit, but from egoistic pleasure. You, yourself, your essence are valuable to me. Abby is disobedient to Z, questioning her decisions and disagreeing with her arguments. Out of love, she sees the dark road Z is going down and is trying to fight it in every way she can. She loves her, yet doesn't hang on her every word. This is what gives her the power of speech. Chaotic juxtaposition Dharma starts as more or less a throwaway joke, but it's brought up so much that I believe it's worth examining. First order of business is defining the terms. The word chaotic is without explaining. Juxtaposition is defined by Webster as the act or an instance of placing two or more things side by side, often to compare or contrast or to create an interesting effect. Dharma, in Buddhism and Hinduism, means either the basic principles of cosmic or individual existence, divine law, or conformity to one's duty in nature. So chaotic juxtaposition dharma, rephrased, is the chaotic comparison and contrast of conformity to one's duty in accordance with divine law. But that doesn't make any sense. How could you compare and contrast only one thing? It isn't a compare and contrast between chaotic and dharma, because chaotic is a word that describes something, not a thing itself. 
The second item in this compare and contrast might be found in this line from chapter 2. Or perhaps, you aren't stockpiling karma so much as dharma, or maybe it's some chaotic juxtaposition of the two concepts. This would make karma the necessary second noun in our compare and contrast. Karma is another concept from Hinduism and Buddhism and is defined as the sum of a person's actions in this and previous states of existence, viewed as deciding their fate in future existences. This would turn our rephrased quote into the chaotic comparison and contrast between conformity to one's duty in accordance with divine law and the effect a person's actions have on their future existence. In other words, the phrase chaotic juxtaposition dharma symbolizes the push and pull between how our material conditions shape our actions and how those actions shape our material conditions and the chaos that creates. This can be seen as an extension of the theme of means and ends that we have already established, but it becomes interesting when considering the other place the concept of dharma comes up in the story. If you're a geriatric like Hussey, you may have recognized Jacqueline's arm tattoo as the logo of the Dharma Initiative from the TV show Lost. Jacqueline is obviously connected to this idea, given that she has a tattoo of it, but in a different way than the dictator like Z is. Means and ends have their effects on everyone, not just authoritarians, as we discussed earlier with its use in transforming people into better anarchists. That being said, Jacqueline isn't some grunt. She is arguably the second most powerful person in the movement, yet she still has plans to exploit it. Emma Goldman observed a similar phenomenon in the youths of the USSR. The young generation in Russia is a product of Bolshevik principles and methods. It is the result of 16 years of official opinions, the only opinions permitted in the land. Having grown up under the deadly monopoly of ideas and values, the youth in the USSR knows hardly anything about Russia itself, much less does it know about the world outside. It consists of blind fanatics, narrow and intolerant. It lacks all ethical perception, it is devoid of the sense of justice and fairness. To this element is added a class of climbers and careerists, of self-seekers reared on the Bolshevik dogma, the ends justify the means. In the USSR, and therefore in the Jubilate movement, both the devout citizens and those who betray the movement for their own benefit are made to do that by their own material conditions. Jocelyne even has a rant that echoes that last line, the end justifies the means. The endless parade of jubilates assassinating their honk effects is to claim the throne, and all the other cases of climbers and careerists within the jubilate movement are as much a product of Z's decision to lead the movement herself as a dictator as her descent into tyranny is. The fate of the jubilate movement was decided the second Z made that choice. Z's decisions when writing the jubilate manifesto also lead to the alienation of the jubilates themselves. Jubilatism advertises itself as a way to express your true self and getting down with the clown is said to be the final form of your self-expression. That simply doesn't seem to be the case. Despite all of their eccentric names and strange costumes, jubilates are all basically the same. Whims of fan culture is entirely homogenous. In regular society, dressing like a punk clown would be a bold act of self-expression. But it kind of stops being eccentric when you're surrounded by tens of thousands of other punk clowns. When everyone is down with the clown, no one will be. As we have established, their leader even views them as identical weapons under her control, not individuals. Even the Jubilee idea of gender is more restrictive than the typical leftist understanding of it. The gender triangle is the newest in a long line of Hussey's joking attempts to turn something fluid and personal into a spreadsheet. In Homestuck, it was troll romance, and in Psycolonials, it is the gender pyramid. In real life, most socialists consider gender to be entirely a matter of self-identification, where all possible positions within and outside the binary are equally valid. Morphing that into a strict bar graph where you fit somewhere between extremely man, extremely woman, and clown is, for one, a very funny bit. Especially considering how Z added horse gender just because her future wife asks very nicely. But it also illustrates how self-expression is only tolerated within the Jubilate movement as long as it fits within their narrow parameters. Which is exactly the same as the systems they're running from. They've recreated the same system, but with different specifics. Sterner has a quote about this process. Revolution is aimed at new arrangements. Insurrection leads us to no longer let ourselves be arranged, but to arrange ourselves, and set no glittering hope on institutions. Stirner's definitions of revolution and insurrection are a little different than the typical socialist ones, but his point still stands. The Jubilate movement recreated all of the systems of oppression indicative to the modern world in new ways. They were completely unsuccessful in destroying them. It doesn't even seem like there's any quality of life increase for them whatsoever. Jubilates are never shown doing anything unrelated to the war and revolution. They're never shown enjoying the leisure time they've gained from supposedly overthrowing capitalism. They're only ever able to do activities for the sake of jubilatism, never for themselves and their own personal enrichment. To quote Marx, The less you eat, drink, and read books, the less you go to the theater, the dance hall, the public house, the less you think, love, theorize, sing, paint, fence, etc. The more you save, the greater becomes your treasure which neither moths nor dust will devour, your capital. 
the less you are, the more you have. The less you express your life, the greater is your alienated life. The greater is the store of your estranged being. The Jubilates are truly alienated. They are required to be nothing more than disposable soldiers, with an extremely regulated avenue for self-expression. They're not allowed to be themselves, and a certain amount of that alienation can be attributed to Riotus. Riotus adds an interesting layer to the whole story. Instead of Z being some lone individual who decides to create this rebellion of her own volition, she's a part of something much bigger than herself, or her movement. What Riotus does is compared to the massive cultural influence the United States has on the rest of the world. The colonialism which most people don't even realize is happening to them. The only way for Riotus to spread his empire is by contacting someone through their dreams, and infecting their thoughts with his brand of clown-themed dictatorial socialism, convincing and guiding them into taking over their planet in support of his ideas. The thing is, the buck doesn't stop with him. It could be argued that Z's influence mostly manifests in the same way. Are the people in the story who would take over their own countries for Z's cause really any different than Z herself, who took over most of her planet for Riotus' cause? It even goes one step deeper. Riotus wasn't the first Jubilate. Even he is doing his colonizing for someone else's cause. And he was to say that the person he's doing it for was the first. Even she might have had another alien visit her in her dreams, telling her about what it means to be a Jubilate. It's colonization all the way down. Halsey seems to be making a point about how living in colonialism has made us reproduce and expand it ourselves. Both the original colonialists and their empire are long gone, likely forgotten to the saints of time, but their influence lives to this day. Dr. Edward Said has a quote that goes, Every single empire, in its official disclosure, has said that it's not like the others, that its circumstances are special, that it has a mission to enlighten, civilize, bring order and democracy, and that it uses force only as a last resort. And, sadder still, there is always a chorus of willing intellectuals to say calming words about benign or altruistic empires, as if one shouldn't trust the evidence of one's eyes watching the destruction and misery and death brought by the latest mission Civilistratus. An empire is an empire, whether it's Roman, American, or Jubilate. They're all a part of the same tradition. It doesn't matter how many good intentions that you may have. If you create an empire, it's going to do what empires do. Colonize. Given what we've talked about, what is supposed to be the takeaway of this story? Don't try to install a clown-themed version of socialism by becoming an autocratic dictator? Not exactly a message that pertains to many readers. Instead, I think that the story is urging us to think about these ideas outside of the realms of politics and economics. We should examine the places these ideas can emerge that any of us can fall victim to. And the best example of those places in the story are social media and simps. Simps and political followers are constantly conflated. Z calls the Jubilites who arrive on boats, George Washington supporters, and the military contracting companies which are under her control all simps. With the latter example, Z even says, It simps all the way up society's ladder, and the higher they climb, the harder they simp. Even though she's a political leader and no longer an influencer, Z still tracks her success by comparing Instagram followers with Kim Kardashian and The Rock, instead of comparing her real-world success to other revolutionaries. The rise of the Jubilate movement and the rise of Z's social media presence are inseparable. Her online fans and offline revolutionaries are one and the same, so similar ideas must apply to both of them. After all, why would state authority change the individual in ways the more minor authority wouldn't? There would surely be a difference of degrees between the mental effects and forcing of hand created by being the dictator of a country than those created by being the head of the neighborhood watch. But ultimately, at least according to the story, people in positions of power, like being wealthy or a social media influencer, will go through their own versions of Z's corruption, although to a smaller, and likely less refined degree. As we've said before, both Z and Abby agreed that Abby's parents' money is what made them shitty. Abby's highly successful career as an influencer may not turn her into the paranoid murderous monster that Z's dictatorship turns her into. After all, that wouldn't help you reproduce and expand your Instagram following as it would your political following and influence. They're different games with different paths to victory. But the way authority alters her thought patterns and forces her hand on certain decisions is the same. Abby's position as an influencer forces her to keep her house spotless. It compels her to not give the person she loves the vocal support which would allow them to make enough money to no longer have to eat weak old mac and cheese and whiskey for breakfast, out of fear that doing so will make her suffer the same fate herself. Back to the subject of Sims. If the theory of means and ends applies to all positions of authority, not only absolute authority, then, surely, its effects on the subordinates of that authority must be similar, whether it's absolute or not. 
It creates the same blind fanatics, narrow and intolerant, and climbers and careerists. Emma Goldman observed in the USSR, and we've observed in New Umsafe. It is almost impossible to draw examples from the story, because the Jubilate movement and Z's Semps are inseparable. They're one and the same. Every example of how our position in the power structure affects Jubilates would also be an example of how it affects Z's Semps, and vice versa. From those who are obsessed with Z, to those who are obsessed with becoming Z. Obsession and ego are major thematic elements of the story that I find simultaneously highly interesting, promising, and problematic. Given that Psycholonials is a story about someone becoming corrupted by power, it only makes sense that it deep dives into the nitty gritty, psychological impact of that. After Z resigns as Supreme Hawk effects, she says this while introspecting about what went wrong. I kept asking myself, how many other assholes in history were dealing with exactly this shit, or watching things unravel for the exact same basic reasons? Even before there was a social media, how much of the attraction to our movement was propelled by all the weird attention-seeking narcissism that clout chasers think they need so badly? But weren't those kind of clout chasing dynamics in play during other periods? Like fame, power, and influence are all kind of the same, no matter what period you look at, or what the platforms resemble. How can that sort of mass vanity pouring into a scene not end up perverting movements like ours? Warping it into a sort of sleazy racket. Not even a money racket, but worse somehow. Like a fucked up ego racket. So the story blames the negative effects of fame, power, and influence on movements squarely on how they turn their authority figures egotistical. But is that really the reason? Can the failure of authoritarianism to install socialism really be blamed solely on a quirk of the human brain? I'm not arguing against the fact that being at the center of something that large certainly does make someone have a dangerously inflated sense of self-importance, but I don't think that's all that's going on here. If someone was born who was unable to feel that emotional response to power, would they really be able to use the state as a tool to sow the seeds of its own destruction? If it were Abby instead of Z, would it really have turned out a little better, simply because Abby cares less? I don't think so. I disagree with the idea that the fundamental issues with the state can be solely blamed on psychology. The idea itself sounds very close to becoming great man theory. Are the problems with the state as a superstructure not at the systemic level? Is the problem not that the state is so much unfathomably larger than the individual that it wins the challenge of wills every single time? All things considered, the mental effects of dictatorial power are completely secondary to the systemic ones. It doesn't really matter who is on the throne. It's designed to work the same no matter what vessel fills its seat. That being said, I don't disagree that egotism and obsession are symptoms of power for most people. And like we've said before, the message of the story isn't limited to authoritarian socialism. It's something that's meant to apply to each of us in our everyday lives. The epilogue gives some examples of other places this egotistic obsession can show itself. Notably, advocating for ethics in games journalism, national pride, a higher standard of virtue in the media we consume, and holding certain individuals accountable for their problematic behavior. If you're like me, you were a little taken aback by that last one. Based on that, and the fact that our protagonist used to be cancelled, I've seen people say that the message of this game is that cancel culture is inherently bad. But I disagree. The main example of this kind of egotistical obsession in the story is Z's desire to take down capitalism and colonialism, which even the story thinks is a good thing. To quote Z, I still think we were right about everything. We were right to start this movement. Right to revolt against our shitty horrible country. Right to take a stand against capitalism. Right to say that the imperialist origins of America and a lot of other countries are the root of the most evils they currently face. Most of all, we were just right to fight, to stop rolling over and taking whatever shit they fucking gave us. What was wrong was everything else. So Hussey isn't saying that every place these emotions arise is inherently bad, but instead, that it is wrong to do these things for the sake of these emotions, to use them as an excuse, as he used inequality as an excuse for her deeds. And I don't know what to make of that. On one hand, if a majority of your time is spent thinking about cancelling celebrities, that certainly doesn't sound healthy. But from Hussey's perspective, it also kind of sounds like an advocation for weak, armchair slacktivism by an elderly white millionaire. The message of the game in Hussey's mind very well could be, caring about marginalized people is good and all, but if you get too into it, then you're basically Stalin. But I don't think that's the case. And even if it was, it's not my personal interpretation. After all, with this line, Z says that the revolution would have worked if there wasn't a leader. I think the problem was me. I don't mean me personally, I just mean a leader in general. I believed in what I was doing, but putting myself at the center of it all was fucking up my brain too much, and so it fucked up the movement too. Maybe there shouldn't even be any leaders. And what is that if not an encouragement of radical action? Surely for a violent revolution to be a good thing, so long as there isn't a leader, that means it's okay for people to care deeply and devote a lot of time to the cause. The same corruption won't happen, even though each of the members will be giving most of their time and energy risking their lives for this goal once it's in full swing. So it doesn't seem to me that Halsey is just complaining about cancel culture. They may be, 
but I don't see enough textual evidence to say that with any degree of certainty. Instead, it seems like Hase is warning against trying to fill the hole in your heart with it. To quote the epilogue, You've just got so much invested in believing you've bought into all this shit for the reasons you're saying you are, and not for the sake of filling the void inside of you. Because if you were forced to admit that, the void would open right back up. And there it is again. All that pain and existential misery. Can't let that happen, right? So, really, it's a message about being honest with yourself. Not letting yourself get involved with causes just because you think they'll fix you. And if you do get involved with them, it has a solution to help you get back out. If you've been active in online socialist spaces, especially during the height of last year's riots, you've probably seen a meme a lot like this. The message being that the only real way to be a good cop is to quit or die. Psycolonials takes a similar approach to every type of authority. Abby even considers deleting her social media to, and I quote, help keep herself sane. This is in the same talk with Z where she talks about how the anti-list is making Z insane. The best example of this is Z herself. By the end of chapter 8, Z is completely overcome with the mental effects of dictatorship. She's paranoid and has pushed Abby away from her. Not to mention that she just declared war on the United States. She's the most tyrannical we've ever seen her. But once Abby comes to comfort her and convince Z to resign and give the friend to Mizzlebip so she and Abby can move to Fiji together, Z is able to finally see it clearly. She's able to let her guard down and understand what she's done to the world, and how power turned her into a different person. At this point, Z could take the crown and try to fix the mess she's made, but she knows it's futile. The system will act the same no matter who's in charge, and even though she created it, it's much bigger than her now. Even if she went back, she'd be back to her Stalinist ways before long anyhow. I think this all checks out with what we've established so far. Why choose to be in charge of a system when you know you can't make a difference and it'll just make you miserable? Leave that mess to someone else. The interesting thing about this idea is the process by which Hussey proposes somebody breaks free of this brainwashing. To break out, you need to have someone who loves you enough to break you out. Once you're too down bad, you can't do it yourself. Abby needed to take it on herself to orchestrate everything that went into Z's exit. The dozen private jets in different countries, the flight plan, the fake South Korean passports, everything. She did it because she loves Z. A major part of the epilogue is devoted to talking about this idea and how it can't be a love that you seek out yourself, or else it just becomes another one of those egotistic obsessions. It has to be a love that more or less falls in your lap and cares enough to sort your shit out for you. And I don't know what to think about that. On one hand, I think it's a little messed up to put the impetus to make someone not suck anymore on their loved ones. But if it really is the only way out, like Hussey implies, I suppose it can't be helped. The thing is, I don't think this is as universal as Hussey thinks. Sure, a lot of people would stop being a cop or delete their social media if their loved ones tried as hard as they could to convince them to. But there would also be so many who would choose their professions and hobbies over their loved ones. Do you really think Stalin would have stopped being a dictator if his wife asked nicely? I can't claim to be an expert on Stalin, or much of anything for that matter, but I seriously doubt it. Some people probably need to have the other option of the good cops either die or quit meme picked for them. That, or destroy the system they are in control of, of course. This may be an unfounded assumption, but I would guess that Hussey fell down a similar path as Z did, and someone loved them enough to break them out of it. And the story itself takes these personal details about Hussey's life, like love is what broke them out of the horrible mental effects of some kind of authority, and tries to universalize it into love being a way for anyone to break out of the grasp of power at any time. I'm sure this message means a lot to some people. It may mean a lot to me one day. But ultimately, it's more of an anecdote than any kind of meaningful observation of the world around us. That being said, love being the answer is a cute theme and at this point a more or less nitpicking. It's a perfectly reasonable lesson to bring into your life, knowing it's not universal. And that's ultimately the point, isn't it? Psycolonials is a complex story. I think that much is obvious. I haven't even gone into everything in this video. Z's parents, for instance, are a plot point that really bothers me. We're really supposed to accept that the reason Z hates her parents for the wrongs they've done to her, changed her name, and sees horrific visions of their corpses is because she wasn't thinking right? And at the end when she forgives them because she realizes they were shitty because of society or whatever, changes her name back to her birth name, and they stop the horrific visions because they're proud of her? It's supposed to be an unquestioned good? Why were you giving your kid traumatic visions in the first place? How is that and everything else they've done redeemable just because they had a hard time as immigrants? Why is it wrong for Z to decide her own name? The thing is, none of that really matters. Even though I can CinemaSins ding about different parts of the plot as much as I like, I still think this is a beautiful story. It says more in 6 hours than most stories do in 600. It's so intricately crafted, yet can be enjoyed just the same without diving into any of that. It made the character of Z, who should by all rights be one of the most hateable characters ever designed, into one of my favorite characters of all time. 
I think what Hussey did here was magical, almost lightning in a bottle. Writing a story about the failures of authority, no matter whose authority that may be, during a cultural moment where one of the largest riots in American history is being directed at police brutality, and the government is failing on all fronts to quell a global pandemic, was an inspired choice. In my mind, this is really the only piece of art set in quarantine that ever needs to exist. Hussey aced it, no more work to be done. This is a story about how systems which give you egotistical obsessions, such as positions of authority, corrupt your mind and use you as a tool for their own ends. How authority is doomed to fail at creating a good world, and leads to the alienation of everyone under it, and how someone who loves you with all their heart can break you out of that corruption. I can't say I agree with every word this story is trying to communicate, but I think it's very worthwhile to mull over nonetheless.